Good morning. It's a word mentioned in the passage you just saw called citizenship. Citizenship. It's not a word we use very often. Uh, I think we use another word more often, uh, subscriber. Right? We all want to be. We all have subscription services that we're a part of, right? I got Netflix, give me my, my entertainment needs along with Hulu, what kind of a name is that? Uh, Disney Plus, got to get my Star Wars on, and that's just basically how my children are entertained in their life, is through Disney Plus, thank you, mouse. And, uh, and, and I subscribe for food, they send meals to my home, they, they, there's services that bring you uh, uh, clothing to your home, you can try on clothes and you send them right back. It's amazing, I just give them like $9.99 a month and all this stuff happens, it's fantastic. What a world. You know what I've never done, though, with my subscriptions? Has anybody, and I'm sure you're all better than me at this, anybody read the terms and conditions for your subscriptions? No. You know why? Because you don't care what you owe Netflix. You give them $9.99 a month, you want entertainment. That's it. End of transaction. You don't care that there might be other obligations. And if there are other obligations, you incur a more serious relationship with Netflix based on the term conditions you didn't read. You just cancel the service. And see, what we've done is we've taken citizenship and we've equated it with subscription. I pay the government taxes, I get services. I pay the government money, I get taxes. We've long since forgotten what Kennedy said at his inaugural address in 1960. That's not what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. And so when we talk about having a citizenship from heaven, we think that means a subscription from heaven. We think that means I incur benefits from Jesus and I give him my faith and life is good. But we need to realize that when it comes to citizenship, yes, there is a great deal of benefit, but there's also obligation. There's also uh, demands placed upon us as citizens. And so what I want us to do is I want us to talk about citizenship today from Philippians 3, 17 to 21. And we're gonna look at how we imitate, how we ignore, and how we imagine in order to become the kind of citizens that we're supposed to be. So let's talk about imitation. But first, quiz time. Some of y'all just broke out in a cold sweat. It's okay, there's no grade. George Washington had to tell the truth about cutting down what? Cherry tree. tree. I'm so proud of y'all. Look at you, good citizens. Paul Revere went riding through the streets of Lexington and Concord screaming what? The British are coming. If I do that now, it's it's weird. All right, last question. Benedict Arnold. All know he's a traitor. What did he do, what did he actually do to betray the country? I know he switched sides, but what did he do? All right, good stuff. Two out of three is not bad. Meatloaf says that. We tell stories like this because we want you to take good, valuable American principles in your life. We don't want to tell you to be honest. We don't want to tell you to be loyal. We don't want to tell you to be courageous. We say, be honest like George Washington, and here's a story. Be courageous like Paul Revere, and here's a story. Don't be like Benedict Arnold, be loyal. Stick to the country. And Paul is doing the exact same thing. Rather than tell you have these qualities, he's saying to imitate. Look at verse 17. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He's saying, imitate me. If you want to follow Jesus, you imitate me, which to our modern ears sounds incredibly arrogant. Paul sounds real stuck on himself. Until you understand that according to rabbinical tradition, according to a rabbi, you did imitate them. So a rabbi would teach you verbally, do this, don't do this, believe this, don't believe that. But you would also live your life with them. And whatever they did, you were expected to do also. If your rabbi got up at 6 a.m., made breakfast, and then spent two hours in prayer, you woke up at 6 a.m., made breakfast, spent two hours in prayer. And he didn't have to tell you that. You just did it. And so Paul's saying, you've had a front row seat to my suffering. You've had a front row seat to my successes and my failures in Philippi. You've seen it, so do the same thing. Because remember, Paul was thrown in prison in Philippi. He was thrown into jail. Why? Because he cast a demon out of a woman who was making a bunch of money for, her, uh, for, the, for the people that owned her. She was a slave. And they were upset about it. And so the power of God was on display in Paul's life, but also the suffering, the pain of following God. Both of those were on display. Isn't that fascinating? Paul says, emulate me. But he's not stuck on himself, because he also says in verse 17, 
and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He's saying there's other people, there's other followers worth, worth emulating. As long as they're consistent in their faith, as long as they're honoring the gospel, as long as they're doing what they've been commanded to do according to scripture, you can emulate them. Now, what's cool here is Philippi was kind of like Dallas in some ways. It was like Dallas in that Dallas is, is conveniently located right smack dab in the middle of the country. I mean, granted, we're on the lower southern side, but still, we're in the middle of the country. So we're a travel hub, right? That's why uh, American Airlines has their base here, right? We're in the middle of the country. It's convenient. Philippi was, uh, was a place that was on its way to other places. And so it became big, it became influential because of that. It was a travel hub. So preachers, missionaries, all sorts of church folks would come through Philippi on their way to other places. And they would be hosted in the house churches. And Paul's saying, when these people show up, emulate them. If they're consistent in the word of faith, if they're consistent in following the gospel, if they preach the same gospel that I preach to you, yeah, pay attention to them. Yes, do what they've called you to do. Live their life, live your life like they live their life, as long as they preach Christ. And you see, we are designed as human beings to emulate and imitate people. That's what we do, right? That's what we do. That's why I'm not wearing a toga today. Because I've looked around and I've seen everybody, every guy wears pants. I need to wear pants. No togas for me, unfortunately. In 1995, women went to the salon and they wanted one hairstyle. What was it? The Rachel from Friends. Fun fact learned that that was actually impossible to do because it was designed by, the, uh, by her hairstylist and like they worked on it every single, like for hours to get it to look just right. So you were, you were lied to, ladies. 1991, I was told to be like one person. Who was I told to be like, guys? I'm gonna be like Mike. Problem, I'm not 6'6". Can't be like Mike, sorry. Everything else, I'm just like Mike. We're told to emulate people. There's a reason why people who are hard of hearing have a hearing impairment, have difficulty also speaking. It's not because there's something wrong with their mouth. It's because they cannot hear to emulate the words coming out of other people's mouths. We are designed to learn and adapt through observation and emulation and imitation. You think that's just a 90s phenomenon? We have this role now. It's called influencer. Where you go on the internet... It's this phenomenon. Anybody see this? You go on the internet and there's somebody on there who looks like their life is entirely all together and they're gonna tell you how doing the diet that they do, doing the exercises that they do, if you parent the way they parent, your life will be complete. If I told you in 2000 I was going to be an influencer, you would have laughed at me. Some of you, if I told you I was gonna be an influencer now, you will still laugh at me. (laughs) Influencer, it's important, right? We like to emulate people. So if you're a follower of Jesus, who do you imitate? Who should you imitate? Well, one, there's the scriptures. Open up the Bible. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you, the Bible is not just a book of examples. That's not what it's there for. It's there to tell you the great story of God's creation, its fall, his rescuing of it, and his restoration of it. But along the way, there are people that we can identify and say, hey, I should be like that. I can be like that. That's a good example. Or, hey, David, not such a great example there sometimes. I'm not going to be like that. So scripture has those. Jesus is not just our example. He's our Lord and Savior that we put our faith in, but he's also our example. But also church history. Church history is littered with saints that are worthy of imitation. Now, I grew up Baptist, which meant that where I grew up, I was only, the only two people worth imitating were Jesus and Billy Graham. (laughs) And outside of that, there was no one in church history worth your time. I didn't know about St. Augustine. I didn't know about Catherine of Siena. I didn't know uh, that St. Patrick was more than a holiday. I didn't know about, I knew about Lottie Moon. She was cool. Um, I didn't know about David Livingston. I didn't know about these people. I didn't know about Luther or Calvin. These people were worthy of imitation. There's this uh, a great uh, podcast, shoot, it's just, Revive, Revive podcast. And what they do is they take sermons that are old, and I mean old, like before recorded history, old. And they read them, they read them, and they preach them. And you can actually hear like a sermon from Luther. You can actually hear a sermon. I listened to one this week by Oswald Chambers. You know my utmost for his highest? Yeah, I listened to a sermon that he wrote. It's amazing. 
Lastly, follow the lives of the saints that are around you. You go to a church that is hopefully populated with other believers that are worthy of imitation. And if you don't go to a church like that, leave that church. Go away. If you find no one here worthy of imitation, find a place where people are worth imitating. This is the most convicting part of this passage for me, was the idea that I stand up here every, a semi-weekly, and I am certain that people look to me because of the position, because of what I talk about, and they think I should live my life like Travis. It was incredibly convicting because I don't know that I always live a life worthy of invitation. I wanna be that person. I want you to be the person worthy of imitation. So be somebody worthy of imitation, a citizen of heaven. And the way that we learn to be good citizens of heaven is by looking at the people who've gone before us and imitating, just like George Washington, just like Paul Revere, not like Benedict Arnold. We, limit, we imitate, imitate them, but we also have to ignore. We also have to ignore, verse 18, for many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So there's a group worthy of following. There's also a group for Paul that's not worth following. Now, he's very vague about who this group is, which is frustrating, but this is probably a group of people that the Philippians don't know. So it's not their opponents, it's not the Judaizers, but he does describe them for us. And he says they're enemies of the cross, which if you're wanting to know whether or not you're progressing in Christ, if anybody ever calls you an enemy of the cross, you might not be, okay? That's a title we want to avoid. But what this means is, uh, Gordon Fee, uh, a commentator I read this week, uh, says that these people aren't necessarily against the gospel. They're against what the cross represents. The idea that you might have to suffer for Jesus. The idea that when you're weak, you're strong, doesn't, they don't like that. They want to be comfortable Christians. And they think any demands otherwise is, is not right. They might be legalists. It says they might be on the, they're, they're on the path to destruction, now, this means that they're gonna spend an eternity separated from God, and they don't know it. So they might be legalists. They might have added Jesus to their pantheon of gods. Maybe they just think Jesus wants them to be comfortable. It doesn't matter. They're not really believers. And then he gives us three additional descriptors. Their God is their belly, they glory in their shame, and their minds are set on earthly things. Basically, what this means is they are focused on satisfying whatever desire that they have, and they think that Jesus just approves of that. Whatever habits they have, whatever things they're involved in, Jesus wants them to do whatever just so that they're happy. Now, this is difficult to do today, but we need to extrapolate from this, what kind of person might this be today? Who might we need to ignore today? Well, first, the, the kind of person that I think Paul's talking about is somebody who you, you would label as a good person. A good person. That's a good guy, that's a good girl. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but... The, they want you to know that they're good. They're very open about how good they are. They, they want you to, to, to be aware of the fact that they do good things, that they're a good person, right? Their goodness is on display. There's people who focused on making themselves comfortable. Again, they think Jesus wants them to be comfortable, to be happy. He wants them to, to, to never suffer for his name. He did all the suffering necessary. Now, he did for salvation, but in following Christ, you will incur difficulty. These people want you to live your best life now. They'll avoid confession and repentance. They'll never actually own up to doing anything wrong. And if they do own up to it, if you do confront them with something, they'll either make excuses or they'll try to show you exactly how you contributed to the problem and you will walk away from that meeting having apologized more than they have. These are people worth ignoring. But above all else, above all else, these people will look like they have it all together. And you'll wanna be like them because we can't help it. We see the fact that they're comfortable. We see the fact that they, they seem to be doing well, that they're successful, that they have 2.5 children and they look exactly like they're supposed to look. And they're following Jesus? Why can't I have it all like that? And we think that's normal. Here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with that. I don't want to call anybody out here. I really don't. But the major export of the United States is celebrity. We ship celebrity out to other countries, and we want people to look at us and emulate us. That's what we do. And as Christians, we have our own subculture. 
We have our own subculture of, of celebrity, right? Like we have our own music, we have our own clothing, we have our own chicken, it's Chick-fil-A. <laughs> We've got all our own sub stuff and we have our own celebrities. We get so excited, so excited, not just because, oh boy, another person in the kingdom of heaven. We get so excited like, like we've collected a Pokemon. We're like, oh, we got another one. Kanye's a believer now. Woo! There's nothing wrong with that. Yay for Kanye. I hope he is a follower of Christ. But I don't know that. I don't know that. And I certainly know this. He's a, if he's a Christian, he's a baby Christian. I mean, imagine, imagine me painting a scenario for you. We baptize somebody right up here. And then the very next Sunday, they're preaching. What would you do? You'd be like, what is that person? Like, shouldn't they like be trained? Shouldn't they like discipled? Like maybe that's a, that's a big leap. But yeah, we look, at, look to Kanye, we look to Justin Bieber, we look to other people and we're like, hey, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn how to be a Christian from them. I mean, maybe, but you don't know them. How about Chip and Joanna? We love Chip and Joanna. I like Chip and Joanna. Man, oh man. I want a family like Chip and Joanna. I want to, how amazing, they have a successful business and they, they talk about Christ. Yeah, they do but you don't know them. You don't know them. You don't know what the image that they project could be something completely different than who they really are. I'm not saying that's the case. Again, I'm not trying to, to call them hypocrites. I'm really not. Certainly not this close to Waco. They could come and find me. But what I'm saying is the people that disciple you, the people you emulate, the people who are most influential in your life are people that you should know that you can draw close to, that you can get to know, that you can see their flaws, that you can see their mistakes and that they're open about, they're not covering up. And you might say, well, Travis, you're up there. I don't know you. Some of you are watching online. I don't know you. Email me. My email is tgcook at pcbc.org. You can call me, 770-883-0994. Yeah, I kept my Atlanta number. <laughs> call me, text me, let's go to lunch. You can know me. Text Kanye. Text Chip, give him a call. And I'm not saying I'm better than, what I'm saying is we can disciple, we can influence you. You can influence me and you should. But the other folks, again, I, I don't wanna say you just completely ignore them, but why am I more excited about somebody, a celebrity coming to faith than I am about somebody in my own church coming to faith? Why is that? Jesus discipled people that he knew. He could have gone anywhere. He could have popped up in Caesar's hotel room and been like, hey, I'm the creator of the world. Follow me. And he could have made Caesar do it too. But no, he stuck with 12 guys, one of whom would, would, would betray him. Worst choice ever. You see, Jesus discipled people that were close to him in proximity. Let people disciple you, and you disciple people who are in proximity to you, to you. So, but it's not just about imitating, although that's important. It's not just about ignoring. There's also a component of this that requires our imagination, our imagination. Look at verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So, uh, Paul is keying in on something very important to the Philippians. They loved the fact that they were Roman citizens because what happened was Octavian, who had become Augustus Caesar, won a major military victory just outside of Philippi in 42 BCE. And what he did was to celebrate, he took the town of Philippi and he refounded it, which is a total emperor move, refounded this city and gave everybody Roman citizenship status because he made it a Roman colony. And then he took a bunch of veterans from his army and he planted them inside Philippi. So 100 years removed from this, when Paul writes, citizenship is still a big deal in, in Philippi because they're citizens of the empire. Their Lord and Savior, Augustus, gave them citizenship by transforming their lowly city into a Roman colony. And what Paul's saying is, no, 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 no. You have a greater citizenship from a greater Lord and Savior with, who's gonna transform not just your city, but he's gonna transform your bodies into something glorious. 
Now, when we think of citizenship, most of us think of a place where we come from. I'm a citizen of the United States because I was born here. You might be a citizen because your mom and dad were born here. You might be a citizen of another country because that's where you were born. But I don't get uh, French citizenship by catching a flight and going to Paris. I don't. But Paul's saying here, don't derive your citizenship from where you're from. Derive your citizenship from where you're going, from where you're going, your destination Your destination is heaven. So derive your citizenship from there. Derive it from the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what Alistair Begg says. Our confidence in heaven doesn't come from our ability to describe it or even to conceive it, but our confidence in heaven lies in the total reliability of the one who has promised it to us. So your job as a believer is to throw off all the old citizenship stuff. Throw it off. Wherever you derive your identity from that's, that's not Christ, and then you run towards who Jesus is. You run towards him. Confession and repentance, that's why it's central to the, 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 the Christian faith. Is because we're constantly having to say, well, I'm not acting like a citizen of heaven. I've gotta throw that off. I've gotta, I've gotta pursue Christ. How would a citizen of heaven act? How did my Lord and Savior act? And then go and do that, and, and we often fail. You might even be sitting there saying, Travis, come on. Sounds really difficult. Sounds really exacting. It is. It is difficult. Look what the text says in verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus knows that we can't keep the laws of being a citizen of heaven. He knows that. He knows we can't do it perfectly. And just like Caesar showed up outside Philippi and won a major victory just outside the city, our Lord and Savior shows up just outside Jerusalem and he wins the greatest victory of all on a cross so that we might become citizens of heaven, so that we can be forgiven for all the mistakes we've made. You know what Benedict Arnold did to betray the country? He was the commander of West Point, which is the military academy now, but at that time, it was a fortress on the Hudson River. And he went and took the plans for West Point, how to, how to defeat it, to the British. That's what he gave them. You know why you don't know that part of the story? Because it doesn't matter. The example of Benedict Arnold is be loyal to your country as long as you have a good reason to. The example of Benedict Arnold is be loyal to the country no matter what. So it didn't matter what he did. And Jesus comes to you and he says, look, I know you're Benedict Arnold. I know that you're a traitor. And you know what we do to traitors? Throughout history, they've been executed. And Jesus says, I know you're a traitor. And rather than executing you, rather than making it, by the way, Benedict Arnold never returned home. He lived the rest of his life, I think, in England. He never came back to the States, obviously. And Jesus says, you can come back home. I'll die for you. I'll take the punishment for you, even though you're a traitor. And he grants you citizenship, which is both a blessing and it has responsibility that comes with it. You might say, well, Travis, that sounds really great. Like, I'm looking forward to citizenship in heaven, but I'm hurting. Like, I'm in pain now. This is difficult today. Look again at the text, verse 21. We await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The body that I have right now, Look at it. It's a normal human body. It's subject to uh, sickness. It's subject to poison. It's subject to death. It's weak. My body's frail. I just turned 38 on Wednesday. Man. Last year uh, for, for my birthday, my metabolism gave me nothing and continues to do the same. <laughs> it's taken the rest of my life off, apparently. 38, I've got these, I'm healthy. I went to the doctor. I'm good. Got a physical, good shape, I guess. But it aches for some reason. Like there's just parts of my body that hurt. Like I, I, I had a, 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 my hip was hurting for a while. Why? Don't know, just does it. Cool, I can't sit on the floor right now, fantastic. <laughs> this body of mine, is, it's, it's got some, it's, it's, it's not, uh, let's put it this way, I don't look like Chris Hemsworth, okay? Uh, it's a little flabby, got, got, some, got some stuff back here and here. I wear the jacket to cover it up. It's got hair in weird places. I won't show you that. 
And Jesus says, this humble body that's so vulnerable that, that all of us in some way, shape, or form are ashamed of the body that God has given us. Right? So there's a whole other sermon there. Jesus says, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna transform that body. I'm gonna make it where it's strong. I'm gonna make it where it can keep the commands that I've given you. I'm gonna make it where you can worship. I'm gonna make it where death and disease and sorrow and sadness and mental illness and body dysmorphia and all this stuff will never touch you again. And I'm coming to do it soon. And your new citizenship in heaven guarantees it. So in the meantime, while you're suffering, while you're struggling, while you're living a life that's so challenging right now, you live as a citizen of heaven. Because here's, here's the thing. Your American citizenship, when I was born, being a citizen of the States was easy. I was a baby. I paid no taxes. Thanks, mom and dad. I didn't have to, uh, I couldn't be drafted, couldn't serve in the military, couldn't vote, which I know is a privilege, but increasingly feels like a responsibility. I couldn't be president. And now that I'm 38, I can do all those things. And after I'm dead, the government will continue to wring every last cent they can out of me through a thing called inheritance tax. As I get older, my citizenship incurs more responsibility. But in the kingdom of heaven, the most difficult part of your citizenship is right now. The 70, 80, 90, 100 years you have on this earth. And then after that, it's gravy. It is worth it. You live for the kingdom of heaven, not, not as an escape plan, but as a, I'm a, I'm a soldier. I can, I, can, I can navigate this. I can imitate people who are worth imitating. I can suffer for the cause of Christ, and I'm not gonna give it up for anything, even if it does mean betraying my country. By the way, there is something worth betraying the state for, for the cause of Christ, for the kingdom of heaven. It's worth it. Stick with it. The song we sang, his goodness is running after me, is running after me. I always heard this song and I always thought it meant like I'm going places and God's goodness is coming to give me more good things. But yes, the listening to it today. What if it means this? What if it means everywhere you go, God's goodness is spilling out into the lives of the people around you as a citizen of heaven? And so the idea that God's goodness is running after us, meaning everywhere we go, flourishing, growth, development, and the glory of God. Is God's goodness running after you in that way? Are you showing the world that you're a citizen of heaven? Are you being worthy of imitation? Are you setting your eyes solely on Christ, ignoring everything else? And are you imagining, are you using your imagination to see what this new life might be like and living in accordance with that? I know a man, his name's John, John Parker, and he has done this over the course of his life better than anybody I know. And we've got a, a short video that we want to share with you uh, to describe exactly what that looks like, giving you somebody worthy of imitation. Let's watch. I'm a lifelong member of the church. In fact, I'm proud to say that we've had five generations of our family as members here at Park Cities. This is our church home and our family. My name is John Parker. And my wife, Zona, and I have been married for 51 years. We have three children, Meredith, Catherine, and John, and uh, four grandchildren. It seems like that uh, health issues have always been a part of our family. It uh, really came into focus about 15 years ago um, when in August of 2006, uh, our grand twins, Ellie and Jack, uh, were born two months premature with a genetic disorder that's a rare form of muscular dystrophy and it's called myotonic dystrophy. They stayed in the hospital six months and uh, soon after they were born, we nearly lost Meredith to a massive blood clot. Uh, as we did further genetic testing in our family, we realized that Meredith, John, and I all had the same genetic disorder, just to varying degrees. September of 2006, my wife, Zona, had the first of many uh, major surgeries over the ensuing years. Uh, after many years of uh, suffering and uh, hospitalizations, uh, our daughter, Catherine, in 2014, passed away from MS. Due to the degenerative effects of myotonic dystrophy, our son, John, has become disabled and now lives with us. And over the past couple of years, I personally have been dealing with cancer and pulmonary fibrosis. If I was going to make it through 
these trials and difficult times, I knew I was going to have to rely on God more than ever before to receive his peace, comfort, and strength that he promises. Instead of being overwhelmed by my difficulties and uh, worldly concerns, I needed to have a view of God's perspective, eternal perspective, uh, with the, knowing that the citizenship of earth is only temporary and that my citizenship in heaven as a believer is secure. Knowing that helped me to uh, try and live above my circumstances and praise him. While I was a citizen of earth, my duty to him was to try and live in a Christ-like manner in response to these trials, sharing the gospel, loving others, and serving those in need. To those of you who perhaps are going through difficult times or will be at some point, I would like to encourage you to continue to draw closer to God and to surround yourself with family and friends to support you during those times. I'm not sure how we would have made it through our difficult struggles without the family, friends, and our church to love and support us and especially to pray for us. I think that even during all the trials and difficulties that not only my family, but I've had personally, I've still tried to remember that God gave us his greatest gift in his son, Jesus Christ. And he was willing to do that for me, even knowing that I was a sinner. And to me, that gives me such great joy to know that he's not only willing to redeem my life, but he's willing to redeem the circumstances of my life and things that, uh, as it says in Romans 8, 28, that I know all things work together for good who know the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So I know that he does have a plan for my life. He is control. And so I don't have to be worried and concerned about that. And so that's really where I get the source of my joy because I know that God is going to redeem all of these things.